I started out as a journalist, but I've done a lot of technology work. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that I'm doing with Duke University's DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. I'm working with Phil Bennett, who's a Duke professor and former managing editor of the Washington Post and a frontline. So Phil wanted to make interviews more transparent and useful. Someone might do 100 interviews for a book or a documentary series, and maybe 10 or 20 percent of what's covered in the interviews ends up in the book or the series. But what didn't make it in might still be interesting to others, reporters, researchers, readers, especially if they're looking at similar subjects through different lenses or over time. So we wanted to know what would happen if interviews were more transparent and useful for journalists and audiences. The first thing we do did is we talked to 45 journalists, including 12 Pulitzer Prize winners, about the minutia of how they process and share interviews, starting with taking notes and or recording an interview and ending up with publishing a story or documentary. We paid special attention to some particular journalist pain points. When processing interviews, transcribing tends to be tedious, time consuming and expensive. But it's also valuable. Without a searchable recording and a verified transcript, misquotes go up, information is lost, and important stories can go undiscovered. Journalists also have few ways to effectively navigate and share interviews. Same goes for readers and viewers, who rarely see source interviews. And when interviews are published, often they're not easy to navigate or share. So this was a key point about publishing. It should be easier to navigate and share interviews for journalists and for readers. We were thinking that if audiences could explore source interviews, including audio and video, so they could see quotes in context and hear how something was said, maybe publications could better earn readers' trust. So we went looking for technologies. We tested many services, applications, and devices for recording, transcribing, organizing, publishing, and sharing interviews. We took many notes, sent hundreds of emails to technologists explaining what we needed, asking questions, and requesting features. Wondering if I'm going to get any laughs here. <laughs> Two years later, we came up with Insight an open source publishing system that enables interactive transcripts that can be shared at the sentence level in context. This is a work in progress. It's not perfect. But we've connected all the dots from recording to publishing with best practices given today's technology. You can see it in action at the Rutherford Living History site at Duke University. The Living History program had a backlog of oral histories dating back more than four decades. Several collections of these interviews are now published as interactive transcripts. We also helped PBS Frontline implement a similar interactive transcript system to publish all 70 hours of source interviews from the documentary Putin's Revenge. The interactive transcript part of this is called the Putin Files. I'm going to quickly go through the current features of the Insight publishing system. I'll show you these on the Duke site, which has more features, including search and timelines. So here's how it works. You click anywhere on the interactive transcript to scrub to the, that point on the video. When you scroll down, the video moves off to the side, and whatever's playing is highlighted blue in the transcript. I also want to point out that the viewer can control the size of the video win window. You can also navigate by clicking the drop down list at the top and choosing a heading. And the transcript doesn't scroll automatically, and this is by design. We want the reader to be driving and not have to reorient. But if the video is behind or ahead of what shows in the transcript window, a clickable jump to active section indicator will appear at the top or the bottom of the transcript. So you can click it to get right to the place where the video is playing. If you select text, it's highlighted yellow and a share dialog box appears. 
Click a Facebook or Twitter icon and you get a pop-up containing the qu quote and the URL specific to that point in the video, the nearest sentence. Click the link symbol and the quote plus URL is copied to the clipboard. So you can share on social media. Note the number at the end of the URL that takes you right to that sentence. Or you can paste someplace like email. You can use this ability to build and share quote playlists. This, this one is from my blog. It's a mix of quotes from the Duke Living History site and the Putin files. The first one's from Dean Rusk, Secretary of State under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. And then the other two are from a journalist who has some eerie observations about Putin. So the Living History site also allows content providers to add annotations that point to different types of supporting content. Text, image, gallery, map, video, file download, and links including links indicating a particular place in the same or another interactive transcript, links with those numbers at the end. So this lets you cross-link within and between interviews so you can, for instance, compare quotes. There's also a timeline element, and the timeline also allows for the supporting content annotations. We recently improved the Insight search capabilities put a word or phrase in the search field under the video. Here it's action, and the terms are highlighted yellow in the transcript, and red dots appear on the video seek bar. This gives you a sense of how many hits there are and where they appear in the video. You can get right to a hit via the seek bar. You drag on a computer or touch on a smartphone or tablet to do this. And if there are also hits in the annotations, in the supporting content, those will appear as yellow, dot, yellow dots in the seek bar, and the annota annotation dialog will automatically open. Here, one of the hits in a search for the word secret turned up an article that the annotation points to. We also improved the site-wide search. Put a term in the search field that's at the top of most pages, and you'll see how many hits there are site-wide and by interview, and the hits appear in a line of context. Click on a hit, and it takes you to that place in the video. You can also do the same type of search narrowed to a collection. So interactive transcripts can enable some analysis. If you look at the 56 interviews of the Putin files, you'll see that 32 of them are videos, and 24 are just transcripts but you can still share any sentence from the ones that are just transcripts. It was a big job doing the editing and color correction on all the videos, so Frontline didn't process all of them. But we realized that we can enable the sentence level sharing whether or not the interviews were connected to media. Here's an example. We just finished an automated version of this for the Duke Living History site. It'll be live on our production site, of course not now, but within in a week or two. Um, there's a long report posted in the Our Research section of the Living History site that details what we learned from the journalist interviews, the logic behind the workflow and the publishing system. Um, that's up now, but it will be up as a, an interactive um, within a few weeks. I also have that enabled on a demo site so I can, I can show it here. You can see the details of the Insight publishing system, including links to the GitHub project. It's an open source GitHub project in the Colophon page on the Rutherford Living History site. Uh, the, just quickly, the publishing system is built on WordPress. It's a template and some plugins. It points to videos hosted on YouTube, and it uses Able Player to play them. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on how the system works for content creators. We spend at least as much time on the workflow leading up to publishing as the publishing system. The key to getting a lot of content published is making it efficient for content creators to capture, transcribe, format, and post whole interviews. We want to make it possible for publications to do things like publish all 70 hours of the interviews that went into a documentary rather than just a few expanded excerpts. So we have a system of best practices and a list of technologies to watch. The workflow is by design 
iPhone, iPhone, Android, and PC, Mac agnostic. The best practice software supports both. Keeping in mind investigative journalists, the best practices also offer non-web app recording and transcribing so that sources' privacy can be guaranteed. And formats are all standard, so you can swap in different tools. Our goal was to have an open source, was to have open source options for the whole system. We aren't there yet. The recording and transcribing software is commercial, but, but it has a month-long trial, so you can test everything out if you choose to use that. We found audio note taker in the accessibility realm. Its first purpose is a note taking system for kids who are dyslexic. The audio note taker developers have been good at responding to our request for features to improve it as a tool for journal journalists. So here are a couple of highlights. Our best practices recorder has a glance mode where the screen is mostly black, which saves battery power and reduces distraction. Tap anywhere on the screen to section and tap twice to mark. So you can section and mark a recording on the fly using this app. Import into audio note taker to transcribe. It's really a spreadsheet with four columns. Audio is on the right depicted by rectangles that show pauses. The transcript is in the next column to the left. Then there's another column for notes. And then the column all the way to the left is for images. So you can keep everything lined up. You can segment into rows, which are automatically time coded. It's a good tool for manual transcription. It also integrates both Dragon and Speechmatic's automatic transcription tools, so you can choose whether to manually transcribe an interview or run it through automatic transcription and deal with correcting it. It also works well as a reporter's notebook. You can keep text, audio, and images organized and connected. You can also mark up things in several different ways, extract by markup, and search across files. So you export the text with time codes to get the format you need to publish. It's WebVTT is what we're using. And upload or paste into the transcript tab on the website. I want to take a minute to point out that transcripts are different from captions in several key ways. I, I've had a lot of people say, oh, use this captioning tool for your project, or use this captioning tool for your project, but we can't. Um, because they're different. It makes more sense to parse transcripts by sentence rather than by a bit of time, like it's usually done with captions. And transcripts have more organization elements than captions. They're chapters, subheads, speakers, and paragraphs. The WebVTT standard gave us chapters and speakers, but we also needed paragraphs and subheads. So we adjusted the note tag for this. So beyond our current best practices, we're encouraging software makers to implement features that improve acquiring, transcribing, organizing, and sharing interviews. We have some asks for open software developers. There are two workflow asks and two publishing asks. As we fill in the open source options, a couple of key needs for the workflow before publishing are a tool that will format any type of transcript that contains timestamps to WebVTT, including manually transcribed transcripts from transcription services, and an editing tool that highlights words that sound alike and automatically tracks what's been corrected. This would make automatic transcription more viable. I just want to mention that mixing up can and can't, for instance, is a common automatic transcription mistake. Computer doesn't know if it's gotten it wrong, but highlighting these types of words easily mixed up and dangerous, for a human to listen to and verify would speed things up. So the open source player, Able Player, is solving problems like transcript subheads, is open to solving problems like transcript subheads and paragraphing, but needs developers to volunteer to help. And let me know if you're interested in contributing to the open source insight publishing system or connecting in some way. We want to encourage all manner of interactive interviews using the insight system or a combination of systems so we can all connect at the sentence level. We want to encourage the ecosystem. Here's my information if you want to connect. And here are some details on insight. Um, there's a lot of stuff under our research that has lots more details on this, on the Rutherford site. Uh, questions?
Right. Do we have any questions for Kim? Thanks. Um, really impressive, uh, and I hope this. Yeah. Okay. It's really, really impressive, and I hope to get some some uh, wide uh, use on some of the things you had on the last slide. You were talking about ambiguity of certain words in the transcription. Um, sometimes there's, uh, I mean, the automatic system might get it wrong, but sometimes there's there's sort of human disagreement as well. Sure. Um, I just don't want feedback. Sorry. Um, sometimes there's human uh, disagreement about the 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 wording uh, that was spoken, and there's also infelicities and gaps and ums and ahs. Um, do you have any support in the transcription for sort of alternate paths of possible interpretations or alternate wordings that might come through or things that might make a difference? We just have a basic style sheet. We take out ums and ahs if, they, if there is no content to them, and that's a, that's a, um, we also, we just use unintelligible if it's unintelligible. Um, you know, I'm talk the can and can't I'm talking about is an obvious can and can't. Um, yeah, so, and you, you apply whatever style sheet you, you want and whatever, I mean, automatic transcription options don't, uh, they, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of correcting and paragraphing and stuff to be doing. So we're not there yet with that. Other questions for Kim? I've actually got a couple of other things we're working on. This is a cross-linked documentary. So once you have all the sources, you can go to the documentary and you can link, you can link the, um, all the quotes in the documentary so you can go back and forth as a, a closed loop. So you can be seeing this documentary and link on something and see the quote in context which is a nice thing to be able to do to kind of judge how the documentary was done. Gives you a nice mental map also of, of how the documentary was made, if you can see the links. This is just a, you know, a mock-up. And audio descriptions, does anybody use audio descriptions? They're great for folks who are deaf, but they're also great for anyone who wants to search a video for something like a stop sign. And when we did the journalist interviews, we got several requests for that. Oh, I want to search the video for this. Um, so we, we've got this implemented. It's not up on the site, but um, you can toggle, there's not an example, but you can toggle the descriptions button to see the descriptions in the transcript. So that's another thing that, that is another useful tool. So those are, those are a couple Other of things questions? we're working on. Oops, sorry. Other questions? Okay, hold on. Hello. Um, so audio descriptions are really for people that are blind um, than deaf because the deaf person can actually see um, what's going on. Oh, sorry, blind, yes. Yeah. Um, it's, now, I, I was confused a little bit with you have transcriptions and when you had those three, uh, those red dots on the video showing where some things were um, in the video timeline, that would be, wouldn't that be done at the captioning, closed captioning level because it's not time-based? How, how does that linkage work? Um, no, the, the, the dots are done by the search. Um, so it searches for the audio text? It's, it searches the transcript. So it's a, it's a transcript search, but then it, it goes in, it's linked, so it goes in and shows you where, and shows you where it is. Okay, I, th I thought you said that the, uh, the transcripts weren't uh, bounded by the, uh, the time index into the video, that that was done at the captioning level. Or maybe I mis misheard that. It's not, it, it, they're WebVTT transcripts. Okay. So the captions don't come into play at all. Okay. Is that... Um, so here's the, here's the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is that accessible, being able to go between the different... Um, you can click on those different uh, where they appear in the video. Is there a way to do it through keyboard navigation at all? Yes. Uh, no, no. It, you can only click on the dots on the, on the okay. here right now. 
Right. So that would be a feature that would be needed for a person that's blind. How would you implement that on the keyboard? Uh, that you could potentially tab to the different occurrences within the, uh, the video, potentially, or keyboard shortcuts to go between the, where it happens in the video timeline. OK. Great. Thank you. you. So you're just tabbing to it and, yeah. Hey, we just fixed something. Good work, guys. All right. Um, other questions for Kim? Okay, let's give Kim a round of applause. Thanks.